Hello, this is Professor Dan Kernler of Elgin Community College. This is another video in my statistics series. In this one, we do our first inference. We learn about confidence intervals, about population proportions. Let's get to it. All right, the first thing we need to do today is remind ourselves of the distribution of the sample proportion. So you recall in general, the mean of the sample proportions should be the population proportion. And then the standard deviation, a little funky, not as intuitive, but it's the square root of the population proportion times one minus that all over n. Uh, this is assuming, by the way, that we have a sample size that is less than or equal to 5% of the population, which is usually the case, and that n times p times 1 minus p is at least 10. All right, so to motivate this particular concept of a confidence interval, we're going to look at some actually Elgin Community College data. Most of our students are actually part-time. According to ECC data, the last time I looked, we had about 69.3% of our students are part-time. Well, what if we randomly select 100 students? The question then, what would the distribution look like for those sample proportions? So if we look at all possible samples of 100 students and we compute the proportion that are part-time, what will be the distribution of that sample proportion? Well, the mean of the sample proportions is the population proportion, so that should be the 0.693. The standard deviation, we can plug this in, that'll be about 0.046. We do have a sample size, 100, that is less than 5% of all ECC students. There are about 10,000 ECC students at the time of this filming. Uh, and if we compute n times p times 1 minus p, 100 times 0.693 times 1 minus that, that is at least 10. That means our distribution should be approximately normal. We can put the mean here, 0.693. If we go out two standard deviations each direction, that means about 95% of all sample proportions should be in that interval. Another way to think about this is 95% should be within two standard deviations of the sample proportion. So about plus or minus two standard deviations, according to the empirical rule, is 95% of all observations. In this case, our observations are the sample proportions. Here's the idea behind confidence intervals. You have your sample proportion in the middle, and then if we go up or down these two standard deviations, we call that our margin of error. A 95% confidence interval for the proportion is then the sample proportion plus or minus that margin of error, or in other words, p hat plus or minus that two times the standard deviation of the sample proportion. Let me give you a visual to help you understand this. Here's our distribution of the sample proportion. We know according to the empirical rule, about 95% of all observations should be within two standard deviations. So suppose I take 20 random samples, and I might get 20 sample proportions. They'll be distributed, some of them will be in the middle, some of them will be more spread out, um, but we would expect about 19 of them should be within that, that's 95%, and then maybe one of them is outside of that band. Well, if we drop those down and add that margin of error, plus or minus two standard deviations each way, and kind of focus on the ones that are within that 95%, if we put our mean in the middle, that's our actual true proportion, 0.693, we can see that if we look at our confidence intervals, 19 of them, or 95% of these confidence intervals would actually end up containing the true population proportion. And then one of them wouldn't. We're not all, sometimes we get just a really extreme observation, a weird sample that gives us a really small sample proportion in this case. And so when we do the plus or minus two standard deviations, we actually missed the true proportion. The key though, is that about 95% of these confidence intervals, if we keep doing this, about 95% of them will contain the true proportion. Now, in practice, you're not gonna know the true proportion. It's just gonna be a big question mark for you. So you're not gonna know, hey, do I have one of the 19 out of 20, one of the 95% that contain it, or do they have the one that doesn't? All you know is that if you keep doing this over and over and over, 95% of your confidence intervals will contain the true proportion. 
All right, let's look at an example. Let's look at this discipline data. I'll put the link in the description. This is our school discipline data. If you recall, this is from a, a large Midwestern school district. Uh, and we had in the database, race or ethnicity was one of them. And then we also had discipline, which was whether or not they received at least one discipline referral to the office in that particular school year. Uh, if we focus on this, black students, they have a 57.7% discipline rate in this school district, whereas white white students have a 23.6% discipline rate. If we make a table of these to get some counts, we can do this in StatCrunch, it's called a contingency table. We'll do stat, tables, contingency, and we want with data. Uh, and then let's do rows to be the race or ethnicity, and then columns to be, to be discipline. We end up with this, and we have our totals for black students, our totals for white students, so we can consider these a sample. This is a random sample of students. Um, and so the question then is, what would be the distribution for each, and then what would be the confidence interval for each? So for black students, we have our sample proportion is about 0.577. The standard deviation would be square root of p times one minus p all over n. Now, we don't know what p is, so we can say it's approximately equal to the square root of our sample proportion times one minus our sample proportion all over n. That gets us about 0 0.016. So that would be, we would use that as our estimate for the standard deviation of our sample proportion. So our margin of error for that confidence interval would be about 0 0.032, 3.2%. Similarly for white students, the margin of error there is about 1.4%. The reason that margin of error is smaller is because there's a much larger sample size. The standard deviation becomes square root of p hat times one minus p hat all over n. And because it divides by n, a larger sample size gets you a narrower interval. It gets you a smaller margin of error. If we visualize that, let's suppose this axis here represents our uh, discipline rate. So we have our white percentage was 23.6%. If we do our margin of error on that, it gets us to 22.2% up to 25%. If we look at our black students, 57.7, margin of error gets us from 54.5 to 60.9%. Here's what confidence intervals do for us. Clearly, these sample percentages were very different, um, but it could just be due to sample size. Maybe there's just a small sample. Maybe if we look at a margin of error and we compute that, maybe it's a really wide interval. There's a lot of uncertainty. But here, because our sample sizes are pretty large, we do these margin of errors. These are very different intervals. What the if you look at this particular, the white percentage, the highest we think that discipline percentage could be would be 25%. For the black discipline rate, we think the lowest it could be is 54.5%. Clearly, clearly different. And now we can start to draw conclusions. This is why this is called inferential statistics. We infer something about the population. We do have to be a little bit careful. This is just about one school district, so we really should only infer something about this school district, but we can start to say, hey, these are very different. There's a difference in the discipline rate between these two groups. Thinking about how these are distributed, we don't know if we have one of the 95% that are on the inside or one of the 5% that are on the outside. Um, if we think about our proportion, we don't know, do I have one of the 19 that contain the true proportion or one of the one out of 20 that doesn't? Now we've been focusing on this two standard deviations, but that isn't always what we're gonna want. Let's, let's dive a little bit deeper into that. Um, Specifically here, if we look at the distribution, we said 95% of all sample proportions should be within there. So 2.5% of them should be below, 2.5% of them should be above. Specifically on the normal calculator, if we find the Z that corresponds to 2.5%, we can see it's about 1.96. That's where the 2 comes from, from the empirical rule, comes from the normal distribution. It means 1.96 standard deviation. So our 2 was approximate here. It isn't exactly 2, it's about 1.96. Just as a reminder, notation here that Z with a subscript 0 0.025 means that's the Z with 0 0.025 area to the right. In this case, again, that's 1.96. This means over to the right, it's 1.96 standard deviations, and that far right endpoint is P plus 1.96 standard deviations. And then on the left, it would be P minus 1.96 standard deviations. What if we want to generalize it? What if we say, hey, let's let alpha be the area in the tails. So then one minus alpha will be in the middle, 
and then alpha over two on the right and alpha over two on the left. So then our distance over here will be z alpha over two standard deviations. And then that point on the right will be p plus z alpha over two standard deviations. And then on the left, p minus z alpha over two standard deviations. And that's where we get this generalized confidence interval, p hat plus or minus z alpha over two square root of p times p hat times one minus p hat all over n. It's important to note now, this is based on the distribution of the sample proportion. So there are these two things that have to be true. Your sample has to be less than or equal to 5% of the population, and n times p times one minus p has to be at least 10. So for our confidence interval, we'll say n has to be less than or equal to 5% of the population. And since we don't know p, we're trying to find a confidence interval for p, we'll do our check and we'll say, we'll be okay if n times p hat times one minus p hat is at least 10. Let's go back to our discipline data. We have our black discipline percentage was about 57.7%, the white was 23.6%. If we check the criteria, it's met for black and it's met for white. Certainly these are less than 5% of all black students and all white students, so we do meet the criteria. We should be able to find a confidence interval. Let's do this in StatCrunch. There's a new command now. We're gonna go to stat, and we're gonna do proportion stats. We wanna do one sample, uh, and then we wanna do uh, with data. This is a little bit tricky. So the way we're gonna do this is we're gonna pick the discipline column, and we have to tell StatCrunch, what are you counting? What are the successes? In this case, we're counting a yes. A yes is a success in this case. Uh, we're gonna do group by race or ethnicity, and then you can do the confidence interval. We're gonna do make sure it's 95%. And we can see for black, 54.5% to 60.9%. For white, it was a little bit different due to rounding. That rounding didn't make a difference for black, but for white, it was actually off by one tenth. That's the two versus the 1.96, basically. So 22.3% to 24.9%. Now, yet again, we don't know if our samples are the ones that are the 19 out of 20, the 95% that are in the middle, or do we have one of the ones on the outside? We don't know as our confidence interval, does our confidence interval include the true population proportion or does it not? All we know is that if we repeat this process over and over and over, 95% of the time, confidence intervals created this way will include the true population proportion. All right, couple of final caveats. There are some problems that can occur with this where it isn't actually as precise as we think. Uh, one of the reasons is all this was based on the distribution of the sample proportion, but we didn't have the actual p, so we approximated it with p hat. That's problematic. So that does cause some actual underestimating. You actually don't get 95% if you do this enough and you actually look at it and look at the results and do a bunch of random samples. You'll see it actually underestimates it. So you're only right about 93 or 94% of the time. It's not as precise because you're using that approximation. Another issue is what happens if we get a sample proportion where there are none or there is one, there's every everyone, so the sample proportion is 100%. <laughs> well, if you put those in, like say you put in zero for p hat into the formula, now your standard deviation is just zero, so your confidence interval, you have zero for the standard deviation, so your confidence interval is just p hat. So this method kind of fails in those two special cases as well. All right, that is it for this video. A lot of heavy stuff in here. This is another one you might have to watch twice. Do some extra questions, some extra research on this one. Hope you found it helpful. If you're interested in seeing more of these, you can subscribe, hit the bell to get notified. And as always, thank you to the Elgin Community College Board of Trustees who approved my sabbatical during the spring 2021 semester. And that's what gave me the time to record and edit and produce all of these videos. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.